Today on CityCast Boise, it's Friday, and I've got KTVB's Alex Duggan and lead producer Frankie Barnhill with me to get into the week's news. We're talking Boise mayoral race, Moscow murder trial gag order, and we find out why Brian Koberger remained silent during his recent court appearance. Plus, our plans for Memorial Weekend. It's Friday, May 26th. I'm Emma Arnold, and this is what Boise's talking about. Hi, Frankie. Hi, Alex. Thanks for being here. Hey. Hello. So let's start with you, Alex. Brian Koberger, the man accused of murdering four University of Idaho students, was back in court this week to enter his plea. And Alex, you went all the way up to Moscow for this. Yeah, I did. Basically, we just know there was supposed to be a probable cause hearing, but he was indicted by a grand jury. So essentially what would happen is like the probable cause hearing, they would have witnesses and testimony. And the public could view that. But because he was indicted by a grand jury, which is pretty typical in serious felony cases like this, that just means that a jury was convened to hear that witness testimony and that evidence. And they decided to move forward with those charges. Um, So then it kind of like fast forwarded his plea, so to speak. So he was arraigned that Monday. And I was a little confused, I think, like a lot of people by uh, Koberger remaining silent instead of entering uh, in a plea. What was the deal with that? So remaining silent doesn't have any really effect on, I guess, a defendant. um, Like, it doesn't do anything, really. Um, And from the people that I've spoken to, like, um, also Morgan spoke to the former Ada County chief deputy prosecutor. And she said that this doesn't have any detrimental effect on the defendant. It just means like you're choosing just not to say anything, which is your right. And that is it's important to note that you have a right to remain silent in anything that happens. You can you can say nothing. And so that's his right. And so basically it also could help him in a way is what she said, because, for example, if the. Uh, defense thinks that they want to file like if he's incompetent so to speak um, and not fit for trial at some point then it would be better to stand silent in that case than kind of pleading guilty or not guilty and having to answer like legal questions or be on the record um, when the state or the defense is asking you questions after you plead like that so it basically just saying nothing, it kind of keeps the door open for whatever could happen, but it still doesn't really do anything. And so I think people were speculating a lot what it meant, but the truth is we don't really, we can't speculate as to what it means. And the bare bones of the facts is that a defendant has a right to remain silent period. So he can do, you know, whatever he wants in that aspect. Um, And it doesn't, it doesn't change much. So. So he remained silent. The judge entered a not guilty plea for him. So what's next? Do you think the state will seek the death penalty in this case? So um, everyone is expecting that that will happen just due to the seriousness of the alleged crimes. And so they were all waiting on that intent to like intent to seek the death penalty. Um, And that can come 60 days after a plea is entered. So we know the judge entered a not guilty plea for him. That's standard, um, which means that he will go to trial um, at some point. The trial was set for October 2nd, but that can always be moved if the judge finds good cause to move it. Um, And so we are expecting to see some filing with the death penalty, but we don't know for sure. So it would be within 60 days and it could be, you know, next week, it could be (laughs) that 60 day mark. We just have no idea. Um, we know in the Lori Vallow case, the, um, she stood silent during her plea and prosecutors were pretty quick to file the death penalty. Um, but it, it really is a lot of work to file, um, an intent to seek the death penalty because you have to prepare for the defense has to prepare a death defense. And they also, the prosecutor's, um, have to find experts that can talk about 
the aggravating circumstances of a death penalty and aggravating circumstances are just what makes the crime more heinous and more malicious. So they have to find people that are willing to speak to, um, how like malicious and heinous the, the alleged crimes were. So who was there in the crowd? I imagine some of the family was there. Yeah, actually, um, there are a lot of family members I didn't recognize mostly because some of them have been out of the spotlight. Um, but we know the Gonsalves family was there and there was a lot of people just, you know, very emotional, visibly emotional. And the judge actually mispronounced Kaylee's name and called her Kayla. And so the family was very, very upset by this. I remember they were sitting um, to the right of me and I remember them saying, we traveled to be here. This has been horrible for us. The least he could do is is pronounce her name correctly. Um, and a lot of reporters were saying, you know, I don't know if he's just nervous or if this is just because um, he stumbled often. And I think that it's just it's such a big case and it's such like a hard thing to just to deal with, I think. And I think he might have been a little bit nervous, like you could hear it in his voice. He was very like hesitant and and uh, kind of shaky. Mm. But he did have some words for the media, though. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. He said that the media has done irreparable harm to the case uh, that may, may affect his uh, Koberger's right to a fair trial. And do you think that's a fair characterization as somebody in the media? Honestly, I I do think that there I, I kind of did agree um, with him there because we know that the Associated Press and a bunch of media outlets have um, filed to vacate the gag order. And the gag order means that like nobody involved in the case can talk about it. Right. And so basically the media perspective is, hey, this violates the First Amendment because people have a right to free speech and we have a right to information. Um, and that's fair. But also the defendant's right to a fair trial, the Sixth Amendment, that can always supersede those rights because like it, it's kind of subjective, so to speak. So like we saw in the Lori Vallow case, everyone said, hey, cameras in the courtroom that they should be there be because this is a violation of the First Amendment. But the judge is like, hey, a defendant's right to a fair trial supersedes that you're you're gambling with life and death here. You're gambling with somebody's life. So it's it's not fair for your rights to have a camera to supersede their rights. Right. So I think that um made a really good a good point. He was like, this has already been so heavily covered in the media and there's just more to come, obviously. And I think that some reporting has been really, really sensationalized and awful and um, just not ethical. And so I think that that can play a big part in into kind of how the judge was was talking about it, just because there's just a lot of stuff going around that isn't really confirmed or couldn't be verified. And I think that that has a lot to do with what he was talking about as well. Like it, it's just so speculative sometimes that it becomes a problem and that, you know, that can affect his right to a fair trial. That's a fair point that he made. So I think that that him saying that wasn't surprising to me at all. So you, do you think it's pretty likely that gag order will stay in place then? I believe that, it, well, the judge said he wanted to hear arguments on it either way um, and arguments on cameras in the courtroom. But I think that just because of the nature of this case and how high profile it is, that they don't really want to do anything to jeopardize his right to a fair trial or even a mistrial, because then you'd have to do it all over again. And that's just something that I don't think anyone wants to happen. Um, so I, I can't really speak to like what will happen, but based on the judge's comments, it seems like he's pretty adamant about the gag order protecting that right and just how the media has behaved. Um, I think he's willing to hear arguments about it, but at the end of the day, it really just comes down to like the Sixth Amendment. Yeah. Speaking of, uh, of the mistrial thing, I've seen quite a few people up in Latah County say that they feel like this case should be moved out of Latah County. Do you think that that's pretty likely that they'll move it out of there? Do you have a sense for that at all? I think that there's a possibility just because 
this town is so small and Moscow is so tiny. And, you know, like I said before, everything's within like a five mile radius. So like if you're walking down the block, you probably know somebody on the next block like nine times out of 10. So I think that, you know, this town has been really affected by it. And I think that there's not one person in that town that doesn't know about it. And also just the nature of like how small the courthouse is and, um, the family, I mean, they only have three courtrooms in there and just how much it really affected the community as a whole, that it, it's pretty likely. Um, and we, and we saw that with Lori Vallow too. I mean, her trial was moved to Ada County just because of the coverage that it was getting and how high profile that was. So I think it's likely, um, but that is something we'll probably know closer to the trial date. Let's turn to some Boise politics news, Frankie, with former police chief Mike Masterson taking some real uh, jabs at Mayor Lauren McLean this week. What's going on there? Yeah, so uh, I've said it before, but I guess we're officially, officially, officially in uh, election <laughs> mode now um, because, yeah, former police chief Mike Masterson, who is running for mayor against uh, Mayor Lauren McLean, and he had his uh, kind of launch, uh, his campaign launch event earlier this week at the Boise Depot, was speaking in front of supporters. And during that uh, speech, he definitely, yeah, he took some he took some jabs, uh, took some swings at her. Um, we already knew that one of the things in this campaign that we're going to be seeing over and over and over again, uh, considering his position as the former police chief of uh, BPD, is his critique of how Mayor McLean has handled uh, controversies with that department. Um, and actually, uh, Alex, Alex's colleague, uh, Joe Paris, was up there uh, at the Boise Depot for the speech and um, he grabbed some quotes. So I'm going to read this one of them. It says, The police department remains in turmoil after the overdue dismissal of the mayor's handpicked chief, referring to, of course, embattled former police chief Ryan Lee. Um, and so that's going to be, you know, just a consistent uh, thing we're going to see, I think, is Masterson constantly talking about McLean, how she mishandled that in his uh, mind and how he would do things differently, how he would, quote, restore trust uh, with de the department, but also with uh, people. He feels like Boise is a place that has lost trust in uh, its city hall and in its uh, mayor's department, uh, mayor since she became mayor uh, four years ago. So, yeah, that and then also housing was another thing he hit on. Um, this is another quote that I thought was interesting. He said, the mayor trumpets a few hundred new homes when the city needs thousands. Instead of solving the problem, she's focused on removing our voices. So, you know, taking some swings that are there, too. And of course, affordable housing has been one of the main things that Mayor McLean has been uh, focused on in her tenure. So, dueling conversations about affordable housing we'll see that as well it's like it's like the police and housing those are the two main topics so far in this election cycle yeah uh it is it's gonna get messy i feel like it's yeah. gonna be gonna be a rough one um i'm curious about the campaign finance stuff like how is that all looking so far who has the most money here yeah, not surprisingly at all. Uh, the incumbent mayor, Lauren McLean, has a lot more money uh, so far. I think the last I looked, she has like at least $200,000 more than Mike Masterson, although he has started to see some, um, you know, more thousand dollar donations pouring in uh, in recent days. It's so early, though. I mean, we're we're in the end of May. We've got all the way till November. We've got uh, until September for more people to file um, for the race. So we'll see how many more people throw their hat in the ring. But, you know, it makes sense for Masterson to be critiquing and to be kind of being aggressive at this stage and then campaign because, of course, he's trying to say strike a difference between the incumbent and say things aren't going well and I want to, you know, turn the course uh, around and really um, make some changes that I think need to need to happen. Yeah. And there was some uh, interesting city council news this week, too, with Holly Woodings announcing she's yeah. not running again for her seat. Did she say why? What's going on with that? Yeah, I was kind of surprised by this. I don't know if you were surprised at yeah, all, but definitely. Um, I was like, oh, OK, interesting. Uh, yeah. I mean, and as I said, I mean, she has had plenty of time to decide to officially file to um, for reelection. But 
I think the quote, so this was, uh, yeah, Ian uh, Max Stevenson and the Statesman had um, this story first, I believe. And and in a quote uh, to him, she said, a lot has changed since 2018 and I'm exploring opportunities for the next phase of my professional and family life. So not clear what that means, you know, mm. very, very nebulous and open ended. It seems like she's leaving a lot of room for deciding what the next phase of her career will look like. So. I'm paying close attention. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if I saw her name pop up, maybe for a different position. Uh, yeah, maybe <laughs> maybe the one we were just talking about. Perhaps. Which would knows? be really wild. That would be a, a pretty wild race for her to throw in, too. Very speculative. We don't know. But uh, yeah. Holly, if you're listening, you can give us a tip. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who would get her seat, you know, because yeah. like, she's been so vocal in the community. But anyone who ran um, would kind of have to fill that hole. Totally. She's been, yeah. yeah, definitely a very strong advocate. Like the zoning code has been a big thing that she's been championing. And of course, we're coming, uh, sounds like, to the to the end of the road with the zoning code decision making that's coming in June. Um, so, yeah, it sounds like she's ready for something new. What that is, I guess we'll wait and see. But um, it's definitely fascinating. And yeah, that's District 5 now doesn't have an incumbent running. Uh, that's covers the parts of the East End, parts of the North End and some areas around Boise State. So, yeah, well, I'll be paying attention to who files to run in that race in particular. Going to be lively. Going to yep. be a lively one for all those races. Well, uh, let's end on something fun. I thought I'd ask you, what are your plans for Memorial Day weekend? Are you doing anything fun, Alex? I wish I could say that I had these big, lavish plans, but honestly, a girl is tired and I <laughs> love to rest and rejuvenate, you know, do some self-care and then be back at the ready to, you know, do whatever happens next, which actually includes, I think, going to Moscow in about two weeks again for a gag order hearing. So I'm sure you will see some updates there. But yeah, we need to we need to prepare for that. <laughs> so <laughs> good. That's a good plan. Get some rest. Yeah. Back to back from the Lori Vallow trial to the Coburger stuff. Yeah. I'm sure you're just exhausted. <laughs> Good. Well, Alex is getting some rest. What about you, Frankie? Okay, I'm going to finally, I've been like, oh, I should do my container garden. Oh, I should do my container garden. Oh, I should do my container garden. It's finally happening this week, and I'm going to do it. Um, we talked with Gretchen Anderson, our gardening expert, earlier this week, and she gave me extra motivation and tips uh, to make sure that I don't mess it up. Um, so I feel like I'm ready. I'm going to go and buy some tomatoes and uh, get some good starts and and throw them in some in some pots to put on my balcony. Yay. Well, I uh, my kid, one of my kids graduated from high school last night. Amazing. So my whole weekend is stuffed with like graduations, you know, parties and also my niece graduated, too. So parties and, you know, graduation stuff. Um yeah, and Gretchen, ugh, love her, but what a bad influence. I already had a ton of plants in the ground, and after talking to her, I went and got six more tomatoes. Do not need them. We're up to like 13 tomatoes now, so I'm going to put more plants in the ground and do a little gardening this weekend if I have some time in between parenting, parenting, parenting stuff, so... That'll be nice. Well, but thank you both for being here. Alex, I hope you get some rest and Frankie have fun with that garden. <laughs> thank you. Sleep well, Alex. I will. That's all for today here on CityCast Boise. The show is produced by Frankie Barnhill, Evelyn Avitia, and me, Emma Arnold. Blake Hunter writes our Hey Boise newsletter, and our music is by Up Is The Down Is The. If you enjoyed our show today, leave us a review. It helps other people find us. We'll be back next Tuesday with more stories from around the city. Bye.